Well, good afternoon, everybody. Here I am back at my 20-odd uh, TPC. It's a pleasure uh, to see everybody again. Uh, but I, I, I got to wonder about the scheduling. Here it is, 4.15, and I'm the only thing standing between you and happy hour. <laughs> and I've got to spend the next hour and a half regaling you with federal wage and hour law. This is a difficult assignment, but I think I'm up to it. Uh, most of you know me, I'm the head of the employment law section at Coles and Thompson, and I've been doing wage and hour work on one side or the other for a number of years so great that I will not repeat it. Um, okay, we're gonna talk about the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, this is limited to wage and hour basics. We're not doing salaried exempt presentation this year. Um, but we're talking about the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. Now I want you to stop and think about that for a moment. Uh, if my math is correct, that makes this law 74 years old, and yet it continues, as you payroll professionals know, to have a tremendous impact every day on the way payroll operates. The act uh, establishes standards in four areas, minimum wage, overtime, child labor, and record keeping. It was passed under the Roosevelt administration. It's considered to be the last major New Deal uh, piece of legislation. The New Deal had a lot of laws that were overturned by the Supreme Court. Uh, this was not one of them. In a 1940 case called Darby Lumber, uh, the court ruled that it's perfectly permissible for the federal government to regulate a business that had some impact on interstate commerce. Uh, and so that is the basis for the constitutional authority that Congress has to regulate wages and hours. Now, many states also have state laws that regulate wages and hours. And the way the Fair Labor Standards Act is written, it is not intended to, uh, to forbid states from imposing tougher regulations than the feds. You can't do less than the feds but you can do more. So, and a number of states do have tougher standards. One that comes to mind is California. I know most of you know that California has its own standards and they are a great deal stricter than those of the feds. So, uh, I, in fact, I always say that for labor purposes, the United States of America consists of 49 states and to California. So, uh, if you do business in states other than Texas, you need to be familiar with the wage and hour laws in all of those states. Now here in Texas, there's no state overtime law. The minimum wage is the same as the feds. So compliance with the FLSA is gonna be compliance with the, uh, with the state law. But that's not true in a lot of other states, uh, as, as you guys know as well as anybody does. All right, so. The Fair Labor Standards Act minimum wage is $7.25 an hour, uh, which I believe is well under the poverty level uh, for, uh, uh, for a, a family of three. Uh, it's, long, uh, it's long overdue for an increase, but there are tremendous political forces that come into play when there's talk of an increase. Uh, businesses and generally the Republicans oppose uh, increase the minimum wage. Democrats generally uh, support an increase in minimum wage. I don't see any increase on the horizon, but then my congressional uh, crystal ball is, is no clearer than anyone else's. So if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. The, the one thing I do know is that the Biden administration is trying to uh, raise the minimum salary test for exempt employees to something close to $50,000 but that's still in the formative stages and I wouldn't expect to hear anything on that till at least till after the midterms. And then if the Republicans take one, one or the other or both houses of Congress, uh, you won't hear about it at all. Anyway, so $7.25 an hour. Now, it's critical to understand that like almost everything else in the wage and hour law, the minimum wage is enforced on a work week to work week basis. A work week is defined as a fixed and recurring period of seven consecutive 24-hour days. It begins whenever you want it to, 
and it ends 168 hours later. Once you have determined your work week, however, it is constant and you may not change it unless you intend the change to be permanent. You got to live with the work week that you select. Now, because it's enforced on a work week basis, there are a couple of ways that employers can violate the law. The obvious one is earnings. If you pay your employees an hourly rate, well, then they're either going to make seven and a quarter or not. But if you pay them on a contingent basis, like commission only or piece rate, then it's possible for somebody who does well overall to have a really bad week and not earn minimum wage. And the fact that they may have made $1,000 in week one and $1,000 in week three doesn't matter if in week two they only made $200, you've got to bring them up to the minimum wage for every single work week they work. Now, if somebody is on, say, a contingency uh, like, like commission and they have a bad week, you can advance them enough to bring them up to the minimum wage and then recover the excess from excess commissions in subsequent work weeks. But they have to walk away with minimum wage in their pocket every work week. The formula is simple. It's earnings divided by hours must yield seven and a quarter. Okay, now, more common as a source of wage and hour deductions uh, or wage and hour violations are deductions. Now, when I talk about deductions here, I'm not talking about legal deductions. Of course, you can gross minimum wage and net less. In fact, that's what's going to happen, right? What I'm talking about are deductions from wages that are made for the employer's benefit. Uh, what are deductions like that? For example, cash shortages is the obvious one. Somebody controls money, their cash register comes up short, and the employer wants to uh, uh, recoup the shortages from the employee's paychecks. Or they have a process for approving checks or approving credit cards, uh, and the employee doesn't follow that, and the credit card doesn't, company doesn't pay. Or damage to the employer's or customer's property. Uh, an employee is, who's uh, working in a mechanic shop takes a uh, customer's car out for a test drive and wrecks it. And uh, they're covered by insurance, but there's a deductible, and the employer would like to get that deductible from the employee. Surprisingly, this is permissible under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Now, most of you say, wait a minute, Brian, that can't be right. I know that's not right. Well, this is one of those areas where the state law and the federal law kind of overlap a little bit. In Texas, we have something called the Texas Payday Law. And the Texas Payday Law prohibits any deduction from an employee's wages without that employee's consent, unless, of course, it's legal deductions. Uh, so if you're going to take cash shortages or damage to property out of an employee's paycheck, you got to have a, permission, a written permission somewhere from that employee. Now, Texas does permit, as most of you know, people to sign a form when they come to work saying, I authorize you to deduct this and that and the other thing from my wages. However, the way the federal law kicks in is, we don't care what you deduct, you got to leave them with the minimum wage. And they cannot authorize you to bring them below minimum wage in any work week. Brooklyn Savings Bank v. O'Neill, 1946 Supreme Court, employees cannot waive their rights under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So you can have somebody sign an authorization, and you should if you're going to do it, but that authorization only permits you under the FLSA to take them down to but not below the minimum wage. You can deduct, now in overtime work weeks, keep in mind that overtime is sacred. So you can only deduct the difference between the employee's wage and the minimum wage for up to, but not more than 40 hours in a work week. So if I make 10.25 an hour, minimum wage is seven and a quarter an hour, that's a $3 overage. In a 40-hour week, you can deduct for your benefit up to $120. In a 50-hour week, you can still only deduct $120 because you can only get the difference between the rate and the minimum 
for the first 40 hours in the work week. Now, there are a number of restriction, uh, deductions which are not restricted by the FLSA, and the obvious one is legal deductions. As I said, you can gross minimum wage and net less. Uh, the Act also permits you to recover cash advances of salary, uh, even if that leaves the employee with less than the minimum wage. So you know the drill. Employee comes to you uh, in the middle of the month and says, oh man, I, I'm broke. I can't make my rent. They're going to throw me out. Uh, I need you to advance me a couple hundred dollars. And being the nice people that you are, you do that. And the employee promptly quits, leaving that 200 bucks unpaid. You can recoup it from their last paycheck if they leave or from any monies due them, down to and even below minimum wage. Why? Because when you gave them the advance, in effect, you prepaid the minimum wage for that week. You are now evening up the books, and it's perfectly okay, but get it in writing. If you just arbitrarily pull a chunk of money out of their paycheck, and there's no documentation as to why, uh, either the state or the feds are going to take a long, hard look at that. Advances of unearned vacation. Now, this is written down anywhere, but this is wage and hours enforcement position. If you've got a plan that says you accrue four hours of pay period or whatever it may be, and the employee needs to take some time off for an emergency, and they can't afford to take it without pay, you agree to advance them the vacation. And they leave before they have earned enough to cover that uh, wage and hours enforcement position, meaning they're not going to pay any attention if you do it. Uh, I can't guarantee that a court would look at it the same way. If uh, an employee went to a small claims court, for example, and said uh, they took this money out of my pay or they, uh, for vacation, I don't know if a court would agree, but if they go to wage and hour, wage and hour will tell them it's not a violation. And arm's length purchases from the employer. Many types of employers allow their employees to buy things from them. You sell auto parts, and every auto parts employee is a shade tree mechanic, and they want to work on their own cars, and so they get parts, and they order them through you. Uh, you may be surplusing some furniture or some, you know, some uh, uh, computers, and you allow the employees to buy those things from you. That purchase can, dedu can be deducted from their wages even below minimum wage. Why? Because they got the goods worth so-and-so, and again, you're just evening up the books. But it must be an arm's length purchase, and that means they are free to buy or not buy. If you require your employees to buy things from you, that stops being a purchase and starts being a deduction. Uh, Almost none of you are probably old enough to remember that famous old Tennessee Ernie Ford song, 16 Tons, I Owe My Soul to the Company Store. Well, when you have to buy from the employer, that's the company store, and they can't drop you below minimum wage. Uh, many years ago, back in the 60s, when uh, the guy I used to work for at the Department of Labor was a young investigator, he was assigned to Clarksville, Mississippi in 1967. Clarksville, Mississippi was perhaps not the best venue for a federal investigator in 1967. In fact, when he got to town, the local IRS agent said, I'm glad to see you. Now I won't be the most hated man in town. And he conducted an investigation of a farm. Uh, and in those days, that was right after the 66 amendments had expanded coverage to agriculture. You still don't have overtime in agriculture, but you have minimum wage. Well, this um, farmer was one of the biggest in the state, and he uh, hired exclusively African Americans, and uh, he, he paid them on paper, but then he deducted for the miserable shacks they lived in, and for the clothes they wore, and the food they ate. And it was effectively slavery in 1967, as opposed to 1857. Uh, and he broke that case. They paid over $125,000 wages to those employees, which, when you figure the minimum wage we were talking about, was a buck sixty, 
and that uh, the act had only been in, a, in place for a year, that's an incredible amount of company store deduction. In his opinion, at least in those, for those workers, the FLSA extension of coverage did more than the Civil Rights Act. I don't know if that's true, but that's a classic example of where employees are victimized by an employer who, uh, who requires purchases from them. Uh, thank God we don't see that uh, too often anymore. All right, now, as I said with regard to the payday law, most states are stricter than the feds on deductions. Uh, even if the proposed deduction would leave the employee with minimum wage, most states require the employee's written permission, and many states forbid deductions altogether. So this is once again one of those areas where it's not enough to know the FLSA. You got to know the, uh, the wage and hour laws in all the states in which you operate. All right, now I'm going to spend more time perhaps on tips and tipped employees than you might anticipate. That's because there has been a lot of movement in this area over the last few years. The act was amended, then new regs came out, uh, the regs were withdrawn to, to talk about some more stuff. The regs were then reissued, and now hopefully the dust has settled, and where the law is now is where it's going to stay, at least for a while. Okay, what is a tip? A tip is an amount of money freely given by a customer to a serving employee. The general principle is that that tip is the property of the serving employee and is not supposed to be taken or glommed onto by the employer. Now, almost everybody knows vaguely about tip credit, unless you do a restaurant payroll, in which case you know about it pretty specifically. Uh, I probably half the people in this room, or maybe a quarter of the people in this room, at one point or another in their careers, when they were kids, worked in a restaurant. I worked in a fast food place. Um, my, uh, my daughter worked as a restaurant, as a waitress for a while. And we all know that serving employees get paid less than everybody else, and they're supposed to make up the difference in tips. That's the tip credit. The employer has to pay the minimum wage, but gets a credit against the minimum wage obligation from the tips that they receive from customers. But that, that concept has a structure and some rules it's got to follow. The definition of a tipped employee is really simple, and this part hadn't gone up in years, is it, is a reg, it regularly gets $30 a month in tips. Well, guys, if you don't get $30 a month in tips, you ain't working in a restaurant, at least not for very long. So pretty clearly that's out of date, but that is the, the minimum threshold for being a tipped employee. And you have to be in a customer contact occupation. You gotta be a wait, wait person or a busser or a bartender, you gotta deal directly with the customer. Um, uh, dishwashers, cooks, janitors, people like that are, can't be tipped employees because uh, they're not in serving occupations. Now, once you become a tipped employee, certain things flow from that. Um, you are required to receive a cash wage of $2.13 an hour. You can pay more than that, but that's the minimum below which you can't go. Now, that goes way back to the mid-90s when the minimum wage was uh, four and a quarter and the tip credit was 50%, and so half of four and a quarter is 2.12 and a half, rounding to 2.13. Well, they, they dropped the percentage part and they just left the cash wage at 2.13. And that hasn't gone up in a long, long time. So the employer can take the difference between 725 and 213, and that's the tip credit of 512. That's the maximum tip credit available to the employer. Now, to be a tipped employee, in addition to making $30 a month in tips and being in a serving occupation, that the employer has to make some disclosures to you. The employer has to tell you what you're gonna earn in cash wage. The employer has to tell you what the tip credit amount uh, will be and, and let you know that it cannot exceed tips actually received by the employee. This is important. And again, this probably doesn't happen much, 
Um, you know, if, if you don't earn enough in a week to average 5 12 an hour, then the employer has to make up the difference. But if you don't earn enough to average 5 12 an hour in tips, you're not going to work there for very long. Um, but I've had cases where employees swear that they did not, uh, were not able to average 5 12 an hour in tips, even though the employer took 5 12 as the tip credit. You must inform your employees that all the tips they receive must be retained by them, with one big exception, the tip pool, tip splitting, tip sharing. Uh, employers may, under certain circumstances, require that their employees who will receive tips from customers share those, those tips with other employees. That's a tip pool. Okay, if the employer takes a tip credit and has a tip pool, the big controversy over the last few years was, who can receive tips out of that pool? Wage and Hour has always taken the position that only other serving employees may take money out of the pool. And I've been involved in cases where they split tips with the bus person and the bartender, but they also gave some to the manager that invalidated the entire tip pool. The employer was required to reimburse the amount of tips that were improperly shared with ineligible employees, and retroactively the tip credit was denied, and those people got back wages amounting to total hours work times 512. That can add up to a bunch of money uh, uh, pretty quickly. So, you never want to mess with the employee's tips. If you mess with employee's tips, you owe big money. Now, the t if there's a tip pool and the employer takes a tip credit, uh, it must be limited to serving employees. That's still the case most of the time. The employer must notify the employees of the required tip pool contribution, which can be a hard dollar figure, like you got to give 10 bucks a shift to the bartender, or it can be a percentage. You got to give you know, two and a half percent to, to the bus people and three percent to somebody else. The tip credit must only be for the amount of tips the employee ultimately receives. So if I get, if I work 10 hours and I get a hundred dollars in tips, well that's theoretically 10 bucks an hour, right? But if I have to tip out six bucks of that, so I'm only left with four, then my employer can't take a 512 tip credit, they can only take a $4 credit that week because the credit is only what remains in the employee's pocket after all the pool contributions are made. And the employer may not retain any of the employee's tips for any other purpose. Now where did the big controversy arise? Because this sounds like the traditional rule. The big controversy arose where employers had tip pools but didn't take a tip credit. Uh, California, Oregon, and Washington, the West Coast states, do not permit tip credit. So they pay their employees at least the full minimum wage. Well, the question arose, if I'm not taking a tip credit, then why does the Department of Labor get to tell me what I do with the tip pool, right? Uh, and, and the Ninth Circuit, agreed with that, and there's some real complicated history of that, but I'll, I'll say the Ninth Circuit and one or two other circuits agreed with that. So Congress amended the law to say that if you don't take a tip credit, non-serving employees like cooks and dishwashers may be rep uh, part of the tip pool. So take a tip credit, only serving employees can get tip out. Don't take a tip credit, Pay the full minimum wage or more, and you can require your employees to split tips with the kitchen staff. But you still can't make your employees split tips with managers or, of course, with the ownership, with the employer. So the, the rule that tips are the property of the employee is true to the extent that there's no tip pool and if there's a tip pool and no credit, no um, uh, tip credit, it's true to the extent that the employer and the supervisors can't glom onto it. All right.
Now, here comes the other big question. What do you do with employees who are tipped, but also have to do other work around the restaurant? And if you've ever been around a restaurant, you know that the serving staff often has to come in early. They got to fill the salt and, shaker, salt, salt and pepper shakers. They got to roll silverware. They're, they, maybe they staff the, uh, the stock, the salad bar. There's a bunch of side work, what's called side work that has to be done. So finally, the way the regs come down, and by the way, this regulation is 25 or 29 CFR part 531 and part 531.56 and following addresses uh, tipped employees. And you can go on the U.S. Department of Labor website, go to agencies, go to wage and hour, and you can, you can find the reg right there. First, they say dual jobs. So if I hire you to be a server and a dishwasher, or a server and a janitor, that's clear, right? You get tip credit for the time you spend as a server. You don't get tip credit for the time you spend as a janitor. So you can be paid two thirteen dollars an hour for the hours you work as a server, but as soon as you start being a janitor or a dishwasher or whatever, you got to get the full seven and a quarter. Now, what happens though um, with side work? And I'm, I'm, a, I'm taking this language largely from the regs. When tipped employees have only one job as a server, but are asked to perform duties other than serving, it is necessary to distinguish work that is part of the tipped occupation from work that is not part of the tipped occupation. All right? Work that is part of the tipped occupation includes work that produces tips, you know, serving the customers, and, and work that directly supports the tip producing work if the directly supporting work is not performed for a substantial amount of time. And it's gonna get better than this, all right? So, you got tip producing work and you got directly supporting work. What's directly supporting work? It would be, um, all right, we all understand what tip producing work is. Directly supporting work means work performed by a tipped employee in preparation of or to otherwise assist tip producing customer service work. And it would include things like dining room prep work, such as refilling salt and pepper shakers and ketchup bottles, rolling silverware, folding napkins, sweeping or vacuuming under tables in the dining area and setting and bussing tables. If you're a busser, it also describes some of the work that you can do. Now that, that work is what we call directly supporting work because it directly supports the tip producing activities and thus directly supporting work can also be paid at the 2.13 an hour. <coughs> unless, uh, unless it's done for a substantial amount of time. So, in the course of a work week, a server works 40 hours. The server spends up to eight hours, or 20% of the hours doing direct support work. No problem. If the employee spends more than 20% of his or her time doing supporting work, the amount over 20% can't be at tipped rates. So if, if the employee works 40 hours and spends 12 hours in, in supporting work, then, they, then uh, four of those 12 hours must be at the full minimum wage. Or, I told you it gets better, for any continuous period of time, if the directly supporting work exceeds 30 minutes, no tip credit can be taken for the time over 30 minutes. So you come in in the morning, you roll silverware for 20 minutes, uh, and then you start your lunch shift. Uh, if that 20 minutes times five uh, exceeds 20%, no tip credit for the amount over 20%. But if you come in and roll silverware for 40 minutes, then whether it's 20% or not, the 10 minutes over 30 minutes that day must be at the full minimum wage. Now, it was easy to write these regs, relatively speaking. I wonder how easy it is in a busy restaurant 
to track how much time each server spends uh, rolling silverware and filling salt and pepper shakers. But nonetheless, this is where the law is now. And this is different from the way it's been over, over many years. It's not completely different, but it's different enough that you need to be aware of it. Now, no tip credit for time that is neither tip producing nor directly supporting, including preparing food like salads, cleaning the kitchen or bathrooms. Ah, okay. Are we clear on that? Any questions about the distinction between tipped uh, time and non-tipped time? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm going to have to get closer to you. I'm wearing my hearing aids, but I still can't hear you. Okay. You know, we have had some case law on that, uh, some out of Starbucks, because, you know, in Starbucks, a manager may also work as a barista, and then the question comes, can you take money out of the, out of the tip jar for the server? I don't know that those court cases gave us hard and fast guidance. So I'm going to give you a, uh, what I consider to be the practical answer. Don't let managers receive tips. Even if, even if they're doing serving work and would seem to be entitled to it, I, I just think you're asking for trouble. All right. Now, when is a tip not a tip? When you tell the customer they must pay it. In other words, when it's an imposed service charge. When you stay at a hotel and you order room service, uh, pretty typically they add 18% to your bill and they don't give you the option to pay it. Now, I suppose if the waiter spilled hot coffee on you, you could probably protest and get the, get the, the tip uh, lifted. But generally speaking, where it's an imposed service charge, like at a hotel for room service, like at a country club, I know so many of you uh, payroll specialists are uh, members of country clubs. And, uh, and then uh, sometimes you get a large party service charge. If there's more than six people, for example, a lot, of, a lot of restaurants will charge a service charge. That is not a tip. What that means is the employer can do whatever the employer wants with that money. So if the employer wants to fold it in half and stick it in their pocket, they can do it. Now, I don't think that's a good idea as far as people's, uh, people's morale is concerned, but it also means that that money is part of the regular rate for overtime purposes, and we'll talk about that. But where I've used it in the past is when employees who are tipped are found to be a little short in their wages, I say, yeah, but their imposed service charges offset the deficiency. And I have successfully defended cases where the wage hour investigator said, you owe a bunch of money. And I said, excuse me, here's a, a sample of how many times during the week they serve large parties and they get a big chunk of money from the imposed service charge. And guess what? That offsets the deficiency. It's something to think about. All right. Now, what if your tipped employees work over 40 hours? Tipped employees receive time and a half of their regular rate of pay. And we'll talk a lot about overtime here in just a minute. But what is the regular rate of a tipped employee? It's not 213. The regular rate of a tipped employee is the minimum wage. So what they're entitled to is seven and a quarter times time and a half equals 1088. But you can still take the same tip credit in overtime hours as in straight time hours. So you take the 1088, subtract the 512 tip credit, and the cash wage for an employee working, a tipped employee working overtime is 576. So uh, if I'm a server, the first 40 hours are at 213. Uh, the overtime hours are at 576, and the tip credit is always 512, assuming you're taking the full tip credit. 
Okay, is that confusing enough? Keep in mind that if the employer, and I mentioned this before, captures a tipped employee's tips, does something wrong, the employer must not only reimburse the seized tips, but loses the tip credit retroactively. Also, if you don't make the required disclosures that I talked about, you can lose the tip credit. And I've seen cases on that, Court of Appeals cases, where the employer, whoop, didn't mean to do that, where the employer did everything right, but they didn't show that they had explained what they were doing, and as a result, they lost the tip credit. Now, just in the interests of war stories, many, many years ago, uh, when I was young and foolish, uh, I represented some topless bars. And these give an excellent graduate education in a lot of subjects, but in tipped credit. Because <laughs> these women were required to dance for tips only. And they were, some of them, they even had to rent the stage while they were up there. A Fifth Circuit case called Rice versus Circle C Investments. They made the dancers rent a square uh, uh, and took that out of their tips. So how does the law apply to that situation? Number one, the employer owes the cash wage, 213 an hour, right? Uh, uh, you can't dance for tips only. Number two, because they were tipped employees, any tips that were earned over and above the 512 an hour were the property of the employee and the employer couldn't make deductions from that. Even if they were making two, three, four hundred dollars a night, by law they were minimum wage employees. Well, guess what? You can't make a deduction for the employer's benefit from a minimum wage employee, right? So the money they charged them for dancing on the stage, for costume rental, for what they called the house mom, for the bouncers, for the DJs, you wouldn't believe these places. Uh, and it's all in cash, too. Uh, all of that had to be reimbursed to the employees. And then, of course, even though they made hundreds of dollars in tips, they were retroactively denied the tip credit. So they owed them seven and a quarter an hour plus all of their deductions repaid. Uh, I will not mention the name of this, this particular employer because I wasn't involved in this one. This one came in while I was still with the Department of Labor and thus I, ethics rules prohibited me from, from representing them. But the, but the employer got hit with $13 million in back wages for these dancers. So those are all the things that you can't do with tips. All right, let's talk about overtime. For most of you, in spite of these little peculiarities, unless you run a restaurant with tipped employees, the principal impact of the Fair Labor Standards Act is overtime. The basic requirement that non-exempt employees be paid time and a half of their regular rate of pay for hours worked over 40. Now, most people, when they think about overtime, they think of it as a reward to employees for working a long and burdensome work week. And certainly that's part of it. But think about when this law was passed, 1938. What was going on? The Great Depression, unemployment upwards of 25%. Think about it, unemployment now just went up from 3.4 to like 3.6% and people are losing their mind. Unemployment in the Great Depression was 25%. And that's in an era when there was typically only one worker per household. Uh, it's hard to imagine the economic impact of the Great Depression. So Congress made a policy decision. They said, if you've got, say, 120 hours worth of work to be done, they'd rather see three employees do it in 40 hours each than two employees do it in 60, right? So they made it more expensive for you to work the employees over 40 hoping you'd go out and hire somebody else. The true purpose of overtime is to spread employment. It's to make hours over 40 cost more money, thereby creating an economic disincentive to work people over 40 and an economic incentive to hire more folks. Now, we can argue all day whether 1938 economic policy 
ought to control what we do in 2022. But it does. So you have to remember when we're talking about overtime that it's supposed to be a pain in the neck to comply. It's supposed to be expensive and complicated, thereby making you throw up your hands in disgust and go hire other people and removing all overtime. That's right where Congress would want you to be. Now, we know realistically that's not going to happen, but it's important to understand that overtime, in addition to be reporting to employees, is punitive on employers. Now, with that cheerful thought, let's talk about overtime. As I said, it's time and a half of an employee's regular rate of pay for hours worked over 40 in a work week. But there are, there's a lot of baggage in that simple definition, and we'll start to unpack it now. All right, just like minimum wage, overtime is computed on a work week basis. Doesn't matter how often you pay. You can pay daily, weekly, bi-weekly, semi-monthly, monthly. Overtime is computed on a work week basis. Once somebody, once you've designated your 168 hour work week, employees who work over 40 within that 168 hours are entitled to overtime. Now that work week basis has some consequences. First of all, it doesn't require daily overtime. Now we know, of course, that some states do. Notably, uh, uh, California, for example, requires daily overtime, doesn't it? Time and a half after eight in a day, uh, double time after 12, double time after 60. Pretty tough out there. But the FLSA does not require daily overtime. So if you have employees who work uh, uh, 12 hours on Monday and then work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, eight hours each, and then Friday at noon, when the employee has put in the 40th hour, you can tell the employee, hit the time clock, hit the door, you're done for the week. And that is perfectly acceptable. The employer is free to move employees' hours around within the work week any way they take a notion to reduce or eliminate overtime. So that's the first consequence of the work week basis of enforcement, no daily overtime. Second, no averaging of work weeks. When I first started working for wage an hour in <coughs> a, a, a year some time ago, the first week I was there, they said, Brian, each work week stands alone. Repeat after me. Wake you up in the middle of the night and repeat each work week stands alone. So if you have an employer who pays biweekly every two weeks and typically is going to be paying overtime after 80 hours in those two weeks, but the employee works 48 in week one and 32 in week two for a total of 80, Overtime is still due for week one. That's eight hours of overtime in week one, and that has to be paid on the regular paycheck for the pay period in which that overtime was worked. That's the second consequence of the work week basis of enforcement, no daily overtime. Paid time off, I should note, and again, all of you know this, uh, paid time off doesn't count toward overtime. So if the employee gets eight hours of holiday off with pay on Monday and then works Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, he may get a paycheck for 48, but he's only going to get 40 hours of work and no overtime is due. Now you know this, but a lot of your employees don't know this, right? And after every single holiday, they come to you, hey, wait a minute, I got paid 48 hours, I should get some overtime. And your answer is no. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, you are perfectly free to pay overtime on uh, hours paid but not worked, holiday, sick, vacation, whatever. It's not illegal to do it, but you're not required to do it. Okay, and the third consequence is of the work week basis of enforcement, no comp time for overtime. No comp time for overtime in the private sector. Public sector is different, I'll mention that just in a moment, but remember this scenario we looked at where the employee worked 12 hours on Monday and got sent home Friday afternoon. Some people call that comp time. They say, well, the guy got four hours of comp time on Friday to make up for the four extra hours on Monday. No, that's not comp time. That's just controlling hours through scheduling. True comp time is where I work, let's say 48 hours in the work week. You pay me for 40 and you take my eight hours of overtime 
and you put it in a bank somewhere, and then I get to take it off with pay at straight time if you're cheap, at time and a half if you're generous, but any way you do it, it is not permitted in the private sector. Now, state government and political subdivisions of states, states, counties, cities, school districts, are permitted to give comp time. Do we have any public sector employers here? Yeah, we got, we got a few. Uh, I don't have a bunch of slides on that, but I can just briefly mention that, of course, comp time requires uh, that the employee agree to comp time in lieu of overtime. Uh, that can be a one-time agreement at the beginning of their employment. It can be a condition of employment. Uh, they can work up to, uh, they can earn up to 240 hours of comp time. Uh, if they are police, fire, or, or seasonal, emergency response types, they can accrue up to 480 hours of comp time. The comp time's at time and a half. So if you work eight hours of straight time, you get 12 hours of comp time. Uh, and when you take it off, it's paid at the rate in effect when you took it off, not at the rate when it's earned. Employers can require employees to burn their comp time if you're running up to the, to the limit, and employers can set a lower limit. They can say, we're not gonna let you earn more than say 80 hours of comp time. After that, we'll pay you overtime and money. But when I say private sector, that includes nonprofits, okay? You're not public sector unless you're government, and if you're government, you can pay comp time. Okay, uh, now, so that's part of what you need to know to compute overtime. You know now what we mean by overtime after 40 hours worked in the work week. But overtime is at time and a half of the regular rate of pay. And that term, regular rate, carries a lot of baggage with it. Your regular rate is not what you regularly receive or what you expect to receive. It may not even be the rate specified in a union contract, and it may and often does change every single week. Why? Because the regular rate is defined as the employee's total remuneration for employment in the work week, with a few statutory exceptions, divided by the total number of hours worked in the work week. In other words, total dollars divided by total hours. And notice that I said total dollars attributed to the work week. So if you give your employees time and a half on their base rate every week, and then at the end of the quarter, you distribute commissions, those commissions must be allocated back over the 13 weeks in the quarter, and you must retroactively compute the overtime due on the additional increase in the regular rate caused by having given them retroactively the commission earnings. Uh, if you gave somebody a productivity bonus of $5,200 at the end of the year, you have to allocate it back at 100 bucks a week to each of the work weeks in the year in which the employee worked overtime. Now, there's some shortcut ways to do that, but the point is all compensation for employment in the work week or attributable to the work week has to be determined, has to be added up and then divided by the total hours worked in the work week to determine the regular rate of pay. Uh, the people that have some of the worst regular rate problems or hospitals. Because you know, you get different, uh, different shifts, get different shift bonuses. If you're a charge nurse, you get this much. If you work in the IC, you get this much. And it goes on and on and on. But at the end of the work week, when the payroll for that work week is done, it's got to sort it all out, attribute it properly, and compute the additional overtime. Okay, all compensation base rate, bonuses, gain sharing, commission, piece rate, incentive, education, blah, 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 shift differential must be included in the regular rate. You pay overtime on all compensation. And I'm going to give you a couple of quick and dirty over uh, regular rate calculations, which are based on 40 hours only. You're not ready to compute overtime yet. <laughs> we'll just learn the basics first. So, Assume an hourly employee, the simplest of all possible payroll problems. Employee gets paid 10 bucks an hour 
and that's his or her total compensation package. If that, what is that employee's regular rate? Well, total compensation is 40 hours times 10 bucks an hour equals $400. $400 divided by the 40 hours work is 10 bucks an hour. So the regular rate of an employee paid only by the hour is the employee's hourly rate. Simple enough. I can screw that up, though, if I give them a bonus. Let's take that t same $10 an hour employee who works 40 hours, and now I give him an $80 production bonus. Well, guess what? His regular rate ain't 10 bucks anymore. It's 40 times 10, he's 400, that's part of his compensation. But there's also the $80 bonus, that's 480. 480 divided by 40 is 12. By giving him a bonus that week, I increased his regular rate to $12 an hour. Now, in a non-overtime week like this, it doesn't really matter, does it? It's just a, a theoretical thing. But when we get to work in overtime, this makes a big difference. All right, what about employees paid exclusively by commission or piece rate, et cetera? Even though you don't care what their hourly rate is, the government cares, the Fair Labor Standards Act cares. You must convert those earnings into an hourly regular rate. So, guy makes widgets. He gets a buck a widget. In a work week, he computes, uh, completes 40 pieces, and he works 40 hours. His regular rate is 400 pieces at a dollar a piece equals $400 in earnings, divided by 40 hours work equals 10 bucks an hour. So the overtime, the regular rate is an hourly rate. No matter whether they're paid hourly, paid salary, paid commission, paid piece rate, given bonuses, paid a shift rate, whatever it may be, in the end, it boils down to an hourly rate. Okay, before we compute overtime, let's look at the only things that employees can earn which do not have to be included in the regular rate of pay. You do not have to pay overtime on the following. You don't have to pay overtime on sums paid as gifts, such as Christmas bonuses. But don't get cute on me here. Huh, well I was gonna pay Sally uh, you know, 20,000 a year uh, or 40,000 a year, but what if I pay her the weekly equivalent of 30,000 and I'll give her a $10,000 Christmas bonus and I won't have to pay overtime on it, right? Wrong, government thought about that. A Christmas bonus should be no more than about two weeks pay. If it's more than that, then the government's gonna think maybe you're trying to scam them what is the purpose of overtime? It's to punish you for working people over 40. If you were permitted to pull a huge chunk of their earnings out when you computed overtime, that would reduce the economic disincentive to work overtime and thwart the will of Congress. And you know we can't have that. All right, you do not have to pay overtime on holiday, vacation, sick pay, et cetera. Remember when we did that slide a few slides ago where we said that if the guy got eight hours of holiday pay on Monday, we didn't have to count those hours toward overtime. We don't have to count the money either. Paid time off is off the table when you're doing the, the overtime computation. Again, you can, but you don't have to. Expense reimbursement. You know, guy drives his vehicle, uh, a woman uses a set of, two of her personal tools and you pay her for that, um, stuff like that. Expense reimbursement is not part of the regular rate. But again, don't get too clever here. The law says that you may exclude the exact or reasonably approximate reimbursement for expenses. You can't just pull a number out of the air. I see this all the time, especially in oil field service industries and in other uh, construction type, uh, building type industries, you know, they, they tell these people, ah, oh, we'll give you, we'll give you $300 a week truck allowance. We'll call it your truck allowance. Well, if that doesn't bear some kind of relationship to what he actually spends, it's not gonna fly with the Department of Labor. And there's, there has been so much litigation out of the oil patch over the last 10, 15 years and that's one of the issues that comes up all the time. 
Now, if you pay them per mile, great. Nobody's going to quibble with that. And if you do a study and, you know, let's say you sample a couple of months and he, he's averaging, you know, 200 miles a week and you figure the government reimbursement rate is 58 cents or whatever it is, and so you take 200 miles times 58 cents and then you round it to about that much, that's going to fly too. But if you just pull the number out of, out of the air, that's not going to fly. And there's a category similar payments, not for hours work, we won't worry about that. Here's the biggie. You do not have to pay overtime on discretionary bonuses. But it's not as big a loophole as it looks like. A discretionary bonus is a bonus where both the fact that there's even going to be a bonus, as well as how much the bonus will be, is only determined at or near the end of the bonus period at the sole discretion of the employer. I actually testified as an expert witness in a case in federal court in Dallas on one of these issues where, where the discretionary bonus was paid by the customer. If the customer was real happy with what the oil field workers did, then the customer would pay a bonus. And, and I was asked to testify on that, and I said, sorry, it's got to be the sole discretion of the employer, not the customer. Uh, it was in Judge Kincaid's court. Nice man, Judge Kincaid. Um, so, what is a true discretionary bonus? I'm the boss. It's the end of the year, getting to be the end of the year. I look at the books. We've had a great year. We've had such a good year that I want to share the wealth with my employees. So I give everybody a $1,000 bonus. Notice that both the fact that there was even going to be a bonus, as well as the amount, I only decided that at my sole discretion at the end of the year. That's a true discretionary bonus. But if I went to the employees in January and I think I killed the Texas payroll sign here. Um, if I went to my employees at the beginning of the year and said, look, work hard, because if, if we have a good year, I'm going to pay you a bonus. I've given up my discretion. Even if it's not a legally enforceable contract, it's nonetheless, it's removed the discretion. Or if I pay according to a formula, this is real common in, uh, in the oil industry where they'll pay uh, uh, a bonus for if you get it the well dug in less than a certain number of days, uh, or if you stick around uh, until you get to the bottom of the, of the dig, it's called bottom hole pay. Uh, that's not discretionary. A true discretionary bonus simply falls on the employee. It's like manna from heaven. Uh, but if you promise and, or hint or imply that they're going to get it, it's not discretionary anymore. All right. You do not have to pay overtime on contributions to a bona fide profit sharing plan or trust or thrift or savings plans. What are we talking about here? 401k. Uh, you don't have to pay overtime on the employer matching share. Uh, talent fees to radio or TV personalities. And fringe benefits, contributions made irrevocably. When you pay the premium to Blue Cross or United Healthcare, they don't give it back. Uh, to a third party for life insurance, health insurance, pension, etc. So uh, fringe benefits, regardless of the taxable nature of them, are not considered to be part of the regular rate of pay. All right. Now, so far, we've talked about payments that can be made and do not affect overtime, but you get no credit for having done them. So if the Department of Labor walks in, does an investigation, says you owe 20,000 in back wages, and you say, wait a minute, I gave way more than 20,000 in discretionary bonuses and, and in fringe benefits, the government's gonna say, that's nice, you're a great fellow, and I'll pay the back wages. But the following types of payments can be made and are not only not part of the regular rate, but you actually get credit for doing them. What are they? Other types of overtime. Any premium at all, working more than eight in a day or after 40 hours in a week, is credited, uh, is excluded from the regular rate, and you get credit for having done it. 
Time and a third for working over eight in a day is credited against the time and a half due for working over 40 in a week. The next two have to be at least time and a half. Time and a half for working Saturday, Sundays, holidays, very common, special day premiums we call them. And if you have a union contract and it says that if you work outside this core number of hours, you get a time and a half, that's uh, also excludable and creditable. Now, what do you mean, what do I mean when I say it's credited against overtime? Let's say you're in California <laughs> and, uh, and you work your employees five 10 hour days. So they work 50 hours. Under federal law, they're entitled to 10 hours of overtime for the hours in excess of 40, right? But under state law, they're also entitled for daily over, to daily overtime, right? Two hours a day for each of those five days. Do you have to pay twice? Do you have to pay 10 hours a daily and 10 hours a weekly? No. That's what this is here for, is that if you're paying time and a half for, for daily overtime in California, it's, it's hour for hour offset against what you might owe under the Fair Labor Standards Act for weekly overtime. All right, congratulations. You're now ready to compute some overtime. You know what hours are overtime hours. You know what money is overtime money. But I'm going to break you in gently. We're going to do some very simple computations. Employee makes 10 bucks an hour, only 10 bucks an hour, works 50 hours. What do you pay him? You pay him 40 times 10 is 400. 10 times time and a half is 15. So his overtime hours are at $15 an hour. Total 150. Total compensation 550. Anything wrong with that? Nah. Kindergarten payroll there. However, I want to change the way you might be thinking about it. When you pay that employee $15 an hour for the overtime hours, what are you really paying? You're paying the same 10 bucks an hour straight time you paid in the first 40 hours, right? What's different is the additional one half premium or five bucks more to bring them up to 15. The true overtime premium is the half time. So, this employee, it's better to think of this employee as having made $10 an hour straight time pay for all 50 hours, and then half of that, or five bucks an hour, times 10 overtime hours equals $50. The, addition, the actual OT premium is the 50 bucks in half time. Now, where that kicks in is when you give a bonus. So our $10 an hour employee who works 50 hours now gets a $100 bonus. His regular rate's no longer going to be 10, so we can't compute overtime on 10. We first have to do the regular rate. So 50 times 10 is 500. That's part of his compensation. 100 bucks uh, bonus is part of his compensation. Total gross 600 divided by 50, $12 an hour. He's been paid 12 bucks an hour, straight time pay for all 50 hours. What do you owe him? Half of that, or six bucks an hour times the 10 overtime hours equals $60. Notice, when that employee didn't get a bonus, he got 50 in half time. When he got a bonus, he got 60. That difference is the overtime on the $100 bonus. All right. Piece rate commission, et cetera. Say you got somebody making 10 bucks an hour, 50 hours, and uh, works five, gets $500 in commission. Regular rate is $10, 500 divided by 50. 10 divided by two is five, five times 10 is 50. Even though they're commission employees, you're converting it to hourly and you're paying them overtime. All right, now we have some fun. If you weren't already having fun, you'll forgive me, this is my third uh, presentation today and I'm old. Um, one of the things we decided not to cover is salaried exempt employees. I'm sure everybody here knows that bona fide executive, administrative, and professional employees, along with outside salespeople, can be exempt from overtime if they meet the duties requirements set forth in the regulations and are paid the minimum salary, which is currently $684 a week. But what about salaried non-exempt employees? Nothing says you can't pay a non-exempt employee's salary, you just have to pay them overtime. So how do you do overtime for salaried non-exempt? Most of you probably do it this way. 
you assume that the salary is for 40 hours worked and you compute full time and a half. This is an exception, by the way, to the regular rate principle because we're not dividing the salary by the number of hours worked, we're dividing it by the number of hours you intended it to compensate. So if you intended it to compensate 40 hours and the employee works 50, the regular rate is 500 divided not by 50, but by 40, by the hours you intended the salary to compensate. Regular rate is 1250. Now, the employee has been paid nothing for overtime hours, right? The whole salary was used up, so to speak, on the first 40 hours. So you owe not half time, but full time and a half for the hours over 40. So you owe 1875 times 10 overtime hours is 187.50. And that's probably the way most of you pay your salaried non-exempt employees. If you've got office people that occasionally work some overtime, you're typically going to divide their salary by 40 or their annual by 2080, come up with an hourly rate and pay time and a half of that. And that's perfectly okay. But let's change the scenario. What happens if you intend the salary to compensate all hours worked? We call this in wage and hour language the fluctuating work week, FWW. If the employer and the employee understand, not agree, just understand that the salary is the straight time pay for all hours worked, whether many or few, rather than for a set number of hours, the overtime is at halftime. We go right back to the regular rate scenario. Total salary 500 divided by hours actually worked is 50. Regular rate's 10, half of 10 is five, five times 10 is 50. Notice the difference. In this situation, the employee was due another $187.50. In this situation, they were due only 50. So what do you wanna do? Well, I'm the employer, I want the cheap overtime, right? But there's a catch, there's a couple of catches. Number one, when, when we say that the salary is for all hours worked, whether many or few, we mean that that salary cannot be docked for any absence short of an entire work week. This is not just like with salaried exempt employees where you can dock them a full day at a time. Fluctuating work employees get their full salary if they work a one hour in the work week. So that's catch number, number one. Catch number two, of course, is employees hate this. They don't understand it, and when they understand something, they don't assume you're doing them right. They assume you're doing them wrong and, and frequently complain to the Department of Labor. But this is nevertheless a valid way that you can pay your non-exempt employees. Now, as I said, fluctuating work week must be guaranteed no docking for less than a full work week. And of course, the salary must be large enough that it always yields at least minimum wage, even in the longest work week. So if you set the salary at, you know, $400 and the employee works 70 hours, that's going to come out to less than minimum wage. That's a violation. All right. Now, fluctuating work week is illegal in California, also Pennsylvania, also New York. So if you're thinking about using this, you need to uh, research state law. All right, uh, as a hint, you may not guarantee a number of hours greater than 40, or you can't claim the overtime is built into a salary. If I heard that once when I was an investigator, I heard it a thousand times. Well, yeah, we're paying them uh, uh, 550 a week, but that's really intended to be 40 at 10 at 15. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Charlie. If that employee gets that same 550, if they work 49 hours, 51 hours, guess what? That's not an hourly rate. That's a flat salary with no overtime in it. And you owe additional money on top of it. Uh, you got to play it like it lays, as they say in golf. If you uh, if you pay them a salary, uh, you got to pay the overtime on it. You can't claim that somehow you paid them more to take into consideration the overtime or built overtime in it. All right, in that scenario, the employee is, is, employer is in violation even in weeks in which the employee works less than 50 and gets paid for 50. 
a guaranteed number of hours is treated as a flat salary with no overtime. All right. Any questions about overtime? I know that's fairly simple stuff, and sometimes the practical part of it can get real complicated. Uh, but, uh, but those are the, the, the fundamental principles. I'll tell you one, um, uh, uh, you know, one shortcut um, is you can take the average work week and, and uh, let's say you get somebody has that $5,200 production, um, production uh, bonus at the end of the year. Um, you, you can either do it by allocating it back work week to work week, or you can um, manipulate the numbers, and I, I shouldn't use the word manipulate. Um, you can take that salary and uh, um, divide it by the, uh, by the hours worked um, and get the half time um, on, a on a greater than uh, uh, work week basis as long as you're computing the overtime on a work week basis. Let me say it this way. Let's say in the year that they made that $5,200, the employee worked 2,400 hours, of which, uh, what would that be? 220 hours would be over, 320 would be overtime. So you could just simply divide the salary by the 2,400, come up with a rate, divide that by two, and then multiply by the 320 overtime hours. And the reason that that's compliance is because the number of, of overtime hours was not averaged out. The number of overtime hours was computed on a work week to work week basis, even though you accumulated that number and divided it into the, to the bonus. You've nonetheless computed the overtime properly week to week. And then you've just, and, and this is in the regs. This is in Title 29, uh, the Code of Federal Leg Regulations, Part 778, the exact computation I just described for you. Okay, recording, counting, and paying for hours worked. The Act authorizes the Secretary of Labor to issue regulations on what records you have to keep. Now, all of you probably know that there are a million different laws, each with its own uh, set of record-keeping regulations, and I'm only talking about FLSA. So they're pretty simple. You gotta keep the normal business information that you would expect to keep anyway. What's the employee's name, rate of pay, gross, net, social security number, et cetera. What makes FLSA record keeping special is you must keep an accurate daily and weekly record of the hours worked. Now that doesn't necessarily have to be punch in and punch out. It can be just total hours worked. Obviously, punch in and punch out or other uh, elect, uh, mechanical or electronic timekeeping is better because it's, it's more provable, but you could just literally